Rahman Rahim. So I'll do my Bismillah Rahman Rahim in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, uh, to start this good topic uh, on Husnazan. Um, when I was approached with this topic, it, it always has a very soft spot in my heart. And um, I just thought about it and uh, continued to think about it. And I just thought that it's such a multifaceted topic in and of its own right. Uh, there are so many different angles that could be linked into this topic through which we can actually inspect. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, I don't have that uh, like that vantage point to talk about it from any authoritative sp uh, space. And thank goodness we have Dr. Sali and inshallah, I'm looking forward to his insights and wisdom on the actual topic. Uh, but my uh, podium here, the space you've given me uh, is, uh, I thought maybe a reflection, a reflective uh, take on what I've understood, particularly with the contemporary scholar uh, from the works of uh, Badiou Zaman Said Nursi, uh, those of you who have been uh, across ISAC in your Islamic studies, you know he's one of those 20th century um, outstanding scholar that speaks uh, to me at a very deep level. And when I came across the concept of his husnazan from his um, uh, works, which is uh, pretty much the Risale Nur, the Epistles of Light uh, works, there were some things that really stood out to me. And so in the next few minutes, I thought, uh, Dr. Zaleha, I'll just scan through what I think uh, uh, how I understood uh, uh, Badiou Zaman Said Nusi's works and how it speaks to me about a very integral part of what Islam really is about uh, in terms of our thoughts and the way we process thought and therefore the way it translates into action and also the way it translates and shapes our character. Um, a very classic, very foundational Islamic uh, creed, but from the lens of uh, Nursi. And so when I was just telling you earlier on as well, when I actually thought, let me just uh, Google uh, or these days uh, chat GPT uh, reference, acknowledge here what uh, positive thinking actually means. I really uh, liked the definition that was given. And if I could quote that, I think this is the premise of where I think um, I'm coming from. Positive thinking refers to the cognitive and emotional process of focusing on constructive, optimistic, uplifting thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes. It involves intentionally directing one's mindset towards a positive outlook and emphasizes hopeful possibilities, interpreting situations in favorable light. Positive thinking is characterized by a mental orientation that seeks to find the good, highlight the strengths and maintain an optimistic perspective, even in the face of challenges or setbacks. If I were to not put, uh, I give you the idea of this is from chat GPT directly, and were to put it into against any Islamic literature on the concept, I think it will just mirror it. Um, I think this is really uh, how I understood uh, Sayyid Nusi's an Islamic uh, notion of Husnuzan. And I thought, Okay, if the semantics are like this, okay, it's meant to have a constructive mind view. It's meant to look at things in the light of favorably in, in good light. Uh, some of the things that comes up like optimism, positive talk, gratitude, solution-oriented approach and outlook, resilience and mindfulness. Some of the things that in our current context, we really talk about, these things really also emerged uh, in this uh, uh, like Google search. So positive thinking is something constructive, something positive, but it also has these uh, virtues that it cultivates. And just a quick, when, uh, when I look at what is the science, is there any science? And I know there's plethora of science, especially recently on how um, positive thinking and has an impact and the way we think has an impact on the way we feel. So our emotional states, our physical states are by and large a product and a byproduct or interrelated uh, with the different facets of us. I said, this is exactly what I had understood from Risale Nur. I just wanted to say just before uh, my take on uh, say Nusi's works, uh, a few things that uh, in, uh, came out in the science, like what is the relationship between thought and emotional states this is from, again, ChatGPT, the things that stood out. Improved emotional well-being, uh, lower, which has the capacity to lower anxiety, stress, even depression. Faster recovery, science has it, that we have uh, better recovery and responses to getting better in relative terms. Enhanced resilience, 
in the face of setbacks and disappointments, how we can actually enhance our inner resilience, which in Islamic uh, concepts, I guess we use things like perseverance, patience, suburbs, and so forth, and better social relationship and connection, better communication. Um, and so to me, it was never a surprise, but we just have signs to just sort of see where we are at, even if you take God out of the equation. But going back to, say, Lucy's works, I said, okay, if we are meant to have a positive uh, view and a constructive worldview, how is that really, how does it really play itself out? How does my tradition, in this case, Rizal Nur teaches me or really deeply spoke to me in this notion of um, positive thinking or husnul dhan? I thought there were three possibilities, three actually uh, parts to it. Um, a very if I can say the word verified Tawhidi approach, so very Tawhid centered, a faith that we have investigated, a faith that we have researched, and a conclusion that we've arrived at. Having that, Rizalino really emphasizes on. The argument here says that if we have really arrived at a conviction, a personal conviction to faith, and have come to reasonable terms, uh, not in a sentimental way, not in a cultural way, but authentically come to a term of reasonably believing in la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, in that there is no God but God and that Muhammad is the messenger of God. This Tawheed centeredness organically and naturally produces a particular outlook, <clears throat> which was the second model. So in these, <clears throat> excuse me, three ways of looking at it, Tawheed centeredness, the outlook that it produces um, and also the third one the kind of honest understanding and reflection of human nature when i saw these three aspects of how risale speaks about how islam speaks about husnuzan it just made like it put all of those signs new research and my own personal life experience into a very clear picture i guess what i meant uh, or what i mean by that is like if i have a verified Tawheed, starting from that first notion. Majority of the works of Risale Nur, and I will say Nusi in particular, is, uh, which is based on our classic tradition, is about this whole concept of uh, oneness of God. How I can reasonably, when there's all these arguments and all these theories put against, uh, uh, against God or about atheism, how do I really know that I believe in one God? And more importantly, what is the character of this God? What is this relationship that this God, is he an active God? Is he an imminently close God? Is he a transcendent God? Has he created this universe? And then uh, like, how does this God engage, the divine engage with us on a day-to-day -day basis, second-to-second -second basis? And what kind of a character that does our divine have? Uh, that of absolute wisdom, that of incredible care, that of... Uh, knowledge, that of uh, mercy, that of compassion. If we started establishing this understanding, then he uses this analogy that when I boarded on the ship, the ship of life, with all my luggage, it doesn't really befit me to carry those luggage on my shoulders while I'm on a ship, because the captain of the ship is well aware of the capacity of that ship and all the load that it can carry. And like the Quranic verse says that, you know, we, we, uh, we, God will not burden us more than we can carry the burden. A soul is not burdened more than it can carry from Amman and Rasulu. Uh, it basically really befits that, that if my captain is in charge of my life and the loads of my life, the inner thinking and processing of life as it comes to me, it should also come from that understanding that my captain, my God is in charge of my affairs sufficient for me is he that anything that visits me in my life and um, in terms of my life experiences in terms of the people that I come across in terms of uh, the different uh, scenarios and challenges that I may come across in in my life it is all very much under his awareness and gaze Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-basir and he's the witnessing he's constantly and imminently closer to me to my own jugular vein so if I have this Tawheed centeredness and a full reliance of God, then my natural uh, response to that is that he is in charge of me. How can I possibly see defect? If something comes up in my life, why would I see it as an absolute uh, negative thing? 
in many ways, that Tawhid centeredness does not really allow me any room. Allow the Rasali Nur says that uh, Islam allows doesn't really allow us a room to think negatively because of that. Because who is in charge of everything? Who is this truly the dominion? Who is this truly this universe? Who's truly life? If, am I really? Uh, who's conferred this life and all the favors upon me? My God the all-wise and all-knowing one who intends only the best. And then the third angle of the human nature. I really, really love that about uh, Nursi's works in particular. I mean, I'm sure there are multiple scholars there, but the one that really de deeply resonates with me is a very honest understanding of human nature in the sense that we are layered, we're complex. Uh, we have different faculties and constituents to us. We have the heart. We have the mind, we have the emotions, we have the intellect, we have the body, we have the interactions between all these facets, you know, certain chemical, many, many chemical things goes on in our uh, states every time, physiologically speaking, we have an intellectual processes, we have, we're also born not in a vacuum, but in a particular society and a particular uh, upbringing, family, culture, society, that influences us. And so, when I started thinking about that and I started um, looking a little bit deeper into that, I thought, subhanAllah, like if we are so complex and as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, such a complex yet honored uh, uh, vicegerents or caliph uh, of God or caretakers of God, caliph of God on earth, then surely everything intended for us by his wisdom is there to bring out some incredible capabilities and qualities that is endowed in every single human being. And we're all in this trajectory of life, boarding on that ship of life, going on more or less in similar ways, very unique to each one of us, but more or less a human being. We have that connection. So the honesty of human nature and the multifaceted aspects of human nature, the Tawheed centeredness of God, directly produces this very integrated approach and worldview and outlook. So when I filter the world, what, what do I look at? That everything is interconnected, that nothing is random, that things are okay. We're not in this haphazard reality hovering around the universe aimlessly, that everything has got a purpose. If you put the seed of the mango in the earth, you're bound to get a mango fruit, inshallah, if all the other conditions are, are, are met. So a very probably like very divergent uh, reflection here, um, brothers and sisters, but I guess the, the, the gist of that, the fruit of all of that considerations for me is that Hosnazan, positive thinking really is based on the way we uh, view our outlook of God, which is meant to be, it's, it's a worship to think of God, uh, almost worship positively because Allah is positive. Even we have this uh, principle in Islam, creation of evil is not evil. Choosing evil to, uh, e is evil. And these choices that Allah has given us, this agency that Allah has given us, in order to, for us to navigate through our experiences and life, it doesn't mean that we turn a blind eye to the setbacks. It doesn't mean that we play a naive role. And sometimes people say that some people are, could be in a bit of a bubble, a rosy bubble that you don't see negativity. It's not, it doesn't entertain that. It is basically one scholar I was reading is that the, allowing the benefit of doubt to people, looking at people with that potentiality in people, knowing, realizing that we all come from different vantage points with different experiences in life, and no one is out there to get us. Everyone is coming from their own frame of references. When we think of that, it really expands our way of thinking and approaching life and relationships with ourselves, relationship with others. And, uh, and as I'm going around this, I thought that Uslozan really gives me a particular mirror to really get into a bit of a deeper introspection into a sense of myself, a sense of awareness that if I did not have that practice of why do I say what I say? Why do I judge someone in the way I judge? Uh, how do I interpret this situation that happened in my life? If I don't have this constant mechanism in a processes of thinking, it has to be a cognitive uh, approach. 
then how am I going to look at the world? My outlook will be uh, affected. Those uh, judgments, or if it's prejudice, it's actually not inconsequential. Um, he also says, and this is in our tradition, that positive thinking uh, is also goes very much hand to hand with hopefulness. Um, that an absence of positive thinking perhaps could mar or blemish our outlook in terms of hope. And I was listening to this uh, particular uh, researcher, Brene Brown. Some of you may may have come across her works, and he she said that hopelessness is uh, hopefulness is not a theory; it's actually a cognitive process of thinking, just the way positive thinking is. It's just the tools for us to look at life as realistically as we can, but know that there must be always layers of wisdom for us to decode. Um, and inshallah, with that, the content of our inner life could be much richer. It could be much, much more expensive. And it's actually very expansive, not expensive, but inshallah, expansive. And it's much more to do uh, with the way we uh, really relate to ourselves uh, in that sight of that divine who's across us at every point in time, but also in the way we relate to each other. Um, and I guess it's just, it, it goes to show that uh, it, these uh, kind of virtues, gratitude, optimism, uh, a harmonious society uh, are just a very natural uh, ramifications of a worldview that contains positivity, that contains optimism, and that contains husnadan, uh, or positive thinking. Um, Dr. Zalaya, that's pretty much all my reflection. Uh, I, I'm, I know it's been a bit sporadic, but I hope it bears be some kind of uh, meaning to, to yourselves and to your time here. Um, I can't wait to hear the actual thing from Dr. Saleh now. That was really good. Thank you, um, Akiz. I think particularly the focus on the Tawhid centric of Verified Tawhid was very, um, yeah, very important and that really stood out to me. And I have a feeling Dr. Saleh will be developing on that further. So we do next have Dr. Saleh. Uh, he is one of our, or Associate Professor Saleh, He's a lecturer at Charles Sturt University slash Isra Academy. Uh, he teaches a number of our classical Islamic studies um, uh, subjects. He's also very much involved in chaplaincy work. Um, you know, he is a clinical supervisor of chaplaincy uh, and uh, yeah, has a great passion that's, that, uh, for, for that area, which really helps uh, support our community and um, support our community. Over to you, Dr. Saleh. We look forward to hearing from you now. Allah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil alamin. Alhamdulillah. Dada khalqi wa rida nafsi wa zina ta'arshi fa midada kalimati. Wa salat wa salam ala rasulina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa atba'ihi wa ahli bayti ajma'in. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد بعد علمك اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد بعد معلوماتك اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد بعد ذرات الكائنات. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Zileha and Makiz. Uh, I think it's a wonderful program. Uh, I really like that topic because uh, it's related to human being well-being. It's related to uh, you know our spiritual life. It's related to doing good or bad and it's related to uh, the society and it's it's related to the, the world peace as well by the way so uh makis i think uh, focus on the tarhidi approach i really like that i have a question because uh, i am here also to learn from you by the way my question is how we can measure our husnuzan or someone else husnuzan the level, the degree of Hasnazan, is there any way to measure it? If, if you would like, please, you can write on chat box. Maybe Mekis, you can read or Zuleha can read. So how we can how we can measure our Hasnazan? Okay, enlightening. Oh, sorry, no. Okay, I'm waiting for responses. <laughs> yep. How do we measure it? Yep. Since all of us, you know, it's related to all of us. Mm. How, how how could we measure our the level of our husnuzan? Um, by the gratitude towards Allah and people. That's one Good. of the responses. Good. Yep. Any other opinions? Mm. 
maybe it's it's a hard question probably yeah everyone's probably thinking about it <laughs> yes okay um and shukur and sabr is one uh also uh and another response is your level of contentment and acceptance of your situation um yes these answers are good but not the answer i'm looking for our ability to forgive when harmed yes yep okay well uh yeah, thank you. You can keep continue, by the way, you know, to give the answer. Uh, if we would like to measure our level of Hussnizan, we should try to measure uh, our knowledge about Marifatullah. The degree of Marifatullah we have, then the degree we have Hussnizan. So there's a very strong correlation between two. For example, when we look at the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Wasallam, he would see everyone as a potential Muslim, including Abu Jahl. You know, everyone. We know the story when he was returned from Taif and what happened to him. And when angels, an angel came and asked if he wishes he can destroy the Taif, what did he say? He said, no. I'm expecting that their, this, you know, their offspring or their children will accept Islam. So having the degree of marifa is correlated with the degree of our Husnuzan. So I'm going to talk about Husnuzan from a rational perspective, from spiritual perspective, a little bit also a legal perspective as well. So from rational perspective, uh, this is Ibn Sina theory, by the way. Uh, I published, I don't like to recommend my articles, but I have uh, two art, three articles are actually related to Husnuzan. One of them is about the Islamic th therapy, a holistic approach. The other two, uh, one of them is about Husnuzan and also the prophetic uh, uh, way of Husnuzan as well, three articles. So according to Ibn, Ibn Sina, a well-known uh, you know, philosopher, scholar, psychologist, physician, and uh, he correlates wham or vice versa, or ill thinking or positive thinking to five senses. So you know what we receive through five senses and we put under the psych in our retentive memory. You know, that's why, you know, in Islam, when a child is born, what do we do? The first thing. We call Adhan. Why? Because Adhan is the abstract of Islam. It is the summary of Islam. So we shouldn't say that, oh, a baby cannot understand. Actually, a baby does. So whatever, the day we, we are born, till we die, whatever we receive or perceive through our five senses, it will have positive or negative impact on our husnizan. And therefore, those who receive negative things always, whether they see, they sight, they hear, they talk, they taste, they touch, and they would have more ill thinking, negative thinking, if it is negatives. If they are positive, then there will be more positive thinking. So as much as we have you know, good things or Islamically or spiritually having good things, if we, you know, use our five senses for this purpose, then the degree of our level, you know, the level of our well-being and the level of al husnizan will increase. As much as we do, the less, and then it will decrease. So therefore, there's a very strong correlation between husnizan and, and well-being. That's why uh, the scholars, they divide, uh, you know, Husnudan uh, in, in three categories. The one first, uh, uh, Mac is focused on, on it, you know, Husnudan towards Allah and Husnudan towards fellow humans and Husnudan towards everything in the, in, in, you know, in the world or environment. So then uh, the, the degree of that, you know, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a lot is mentioned you know, in the Quran or in the Hadith, in details, 
a very important scholarly work. If you look at the work of Salaf, the first three generations of Islam, or Muslim, first three generations of Muslims, and then later Mufassirs, they had very interesting approach. Very, very interesting. Uh, for example, for Tabari, a well-known Mufassir, he says that there's a strong correlation between Husnuzan and you know your rewards. So according to the degree of your husnuzan, and you know, your your deeds will be will be measured in, in, in hereafter. This Tabari says. And for example, uh, Imam Ghazali says, you know, thinking husnuzan, husnuzan by this, according to one hadith, is ibadah, is you know, uh, act of ibadah, of worship. So thinking positively is an act of ibadah. And uh, for, for Al-Ghazali, particularly, and those who are like uh, leaders or you know, teaching Islam or parents, uh, they, sh even if the negative or ill thinking, you know, comes to their mind, try that, uh, they should ask forgiveness according to Al-Ghazali. Because if they ask forgiveness, then it will not stay there. If you don't, it may grow, and affect our life. In regard to, you know, well-being, and and husnuzan, as I said, that when we perceive something, and we put under the side, whether from the childhood or later, and and then gradually we may not be aware because, uh, according to Ibn Sina, our faculty of imagination is like a mirror. By the way, it would reflect whatever we see. Whatever we see, it will reflect. So whatever we hear. That's why, you know, if we have ill thinking in our back of our mind or under the psyche, and gradually if we think about it and long and too much, and it will transform to wahm, and then we will, like negative thinking, then we will uh, clothe it in our mind, form it in our mind, and then sometimes it can reflect like a hallucinations as well. Therefore, you know, how we can, if something negative comes to our mind, try that we should try to divert our, our mind for something good. The zikr is best of them. You know, Ismail al uh, in his Tafsir Ruh al Bayan, uh, I really love, you know, his Tafsir, particularly from the spiritual aspects. When he commented on uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila. Oh Allah, you did not create this in vain. So he says that, uh, so what does it mean? Then whatever Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created, actually, you know, have purposes. It purpose. So we should look at positively. Then nothing is aimless. Everything has aim or aims. Whatever happening, happening, whatever is going on in the world. So uh, Mac is mentioned about uh, Bedouin and Said Nursi. He divides, uh, by the way, uh, you know, outlook in in two ways: positive and negative. You know, positive outlook. He calls Nabawi outlook, prophetic outlook. You know, look at everything with positively. I would like to give you maybe uh, two, three examples. And one of them, for example, when uh, before the Hudaybi Treaty, you know, the uh, ambassador or representative of Mushriks, Suhail, he, he was coming. When Prophet saw him, he said that, oh, we have an easy task now because his name is Suhail, he will be easy. You know, Suhail doesn't know Arabic means, it's, you know, an easy man. And what we know that gradually, alhamdulillah, there was like, a, you know, peace treaty. There was a peace treaty between Muslims and polytheists. And the second thing is about the positive thinking. Let's look at the example of, example, the tragedy of Karbala. You know, it's a very sad part of the history of Islam. When we read in the historical books, you, we can say that how could that happen? It's unbelievable, unbelievable. And you know the tragedy. And even they, you know, killed most of the Ahl Bayt or who was with Hussein radiallahu anh, And even they did not bury their corpse. They did not perform the Sanalta Janaza, you know, funeral service. And then after that, we know what happened to Ahl Bayt, who maybe. Uh, 200 years maybe, except in some certain times, such as during the Umar, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, uh, some caliph during the you know, uh, Abbasids. And most of time, 
they were under persecution, under pressure. And then when the Karbala tragedy happened, what we know that even they started cursing al uh, during the Friday khutbah. You know, how terrible is this? But what's the consequence? So if you think negatively, it's terrible. If you think positively, look at the consequence. So to see something that for Husnuzan, we need to correlate what's going to be the consequence of that. The consequence of Karbala tragedy, most of the Halibay, they left Middle East. No, they went to Indonesia, they went to India, Pakistan, Central Asia, Africa, Anatolia. And wherever they went, they planted the seed of Islam because part of their nature to work for the Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them an important task, serving Iman and the Quran more than the politics. Serving Iman and the Quran much, 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 much higher than politics. The best politics can help you to have a, a you know a, a prosperity, peace, which is good. But how about Iman? So Alibate, when they wherever they went, today just in the Asia, there are over Asia and South Asia, 850 million Muslims. If there were no, there was no Karbala tragedy, probably the Alibate wouldn't immigrate. Or some companions who love Alibate. Or those who love Alibate, by the way, later generations. Just imagine you go to a mosque, they are cursing the prophet on, uh, prophet's descendant on Friday. Will you, will you go to that mosque? No. Therefore, I think there's a correlation between the consequence and Husnudan, positive thinking. So when we face something that we dislike, we should think the consequence. Uh, again, Said Nushi, he divides that in, in two ways. He says, um, you know, relative beauty, essential beauty. And for example, paradise is essential beauty. Or illness, he considered it as relative beauty. Why? And even he utilized 25 ways of positive thinking about the illness. Why? Because it reminds you that you are mortal. It reminds us that, you know, uh, get ready, prepare yourself. This is not your permanent house. Prepare for eternal happiness. So it goes on. I, I don't have time to go in details. So therefore, uh, if we would like to increase our positive thinking or husnuzan, we should look at the consequence. This part of our day life, you know, you, go, you study... Uh, you, you prepare essays and exams and it's stressful, uh, but think about the consequence. For Islamic studies, not just for all it, for hereafter as well. So there's a correlation, you know, between Husnuzan and between, you know, the, the, the consequence, the beauty. Uh, because, you know, uh, if you return back to Ismail Haqqa Bursay's point of view in his tafsir, uh, you know, O oh Allah, you did not create this in vain. Rabbana ma hada batula. And, and the consequence of that, that in order we face, actually, there's a beauty there. Whatever you see on earth, whatever you see in the world. I give the example of, you know, the uh, Karbala tragedy. So see the consequence. And then uh, in regarding to, you know, uh, good deeds, the correlation between Husnuzan and good deeds. Because when we think positively and continue to think about that, that gradually it will reflect in our deeds and we'll put in practice. It will not something that just stay in your mind. So when you put in practice, Husnuzan, it will become an act of worship. And he also, you know, as I said, uh, the scholars divided in, you know, Husnuzan towards Allah, Husnuzan towards human fellow, and Husnuzan towards universe. So towards Allah, he had the role of intention is the key. You know, we, we should always have universal intention. Let me say even, you know, when we sit for, on, on, for you know, for the, for the dinner, uh, if we think that, you know, have Hasnuzan, look, this food is like uh, the food of the Jannah. Having, you know, eating with such intention. Well, I'm drinking water. Uh, this water is from how the Kathar, Kathar pool. 
you know, positive thinking. When we have a such mentality and gradually, you know, we'll be able to think positively about almost everything. And that will lead, of course, what, what Ibn Sina calls intellectual satisfaction. You know, uh, he divides satisfaction in three. He says animal satisfaction, you know, um, animal eats, drinks. And if, if we, we are not created for this. We eat, we drink as, as well. But that, that does not bring permanent satisfaction. And second, he says imaginary. So, you know, we would like to have a house, we would like to have a job, we would like to have a car, and you know, all, all these all the things. And Ibn Sina says, this will not bring permanent satisfaction as well, permanent happiness too. It's imaginary. You will imagine, but it will not. Otherwise, today the, developed, the people who live in the developed countries, they would be the most happiest people on earth. But I don't know, probably, I think we have a, a psychologist I saw on the list, uh, one of our students, by the way, also. Uh, they say that, I, I don't know, you know, if you would like to see a psychologist, you need to make appointment six months. It will take six months to see a psychologist if it's not urgent in Australia. You can see in regarding to that imaginary satisfaction is not bringing, you know, permanent satisfaction and happiness. And the third one, Akunti Ibn Sina, intellectual satisfaction. And he says that the prophets there in the top of that, the peak of that, you know, whatever, you know, we allocate all our ability, all our five senses, including our, of our aql, for, for the good purpose. What we call it is some for sake of Allah. You know, someone may call voluntarily. And then that would lead uh, intellectual satisfaction. And that satisfaction, by the way, it's always in your mind. If I ask you, well, can you let me know uh, the, the, the most happiest of your lifetime? You wouldn't write, well, you know, I had a dinner 10 years ago. I ate this. But you will say, well, I helped an orphan. I educated him. He's now, alhamdulillah, mashallah, has a position. He's doing good. You know, I was mentoring a, 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 a student. Uh, he's doing very well now. You know, I helped an elder person. I helped someone who, who, is in, who was in need. You know, I made such dhikr. Or, you know, the, the, the happiness when I was in hajj, the spiritual happiness, satisfaction. So, as long as, you know, we put the husnuzan in practice for the good things, that would lead the intellectual satisfaction. And for this world, for hereafter, we are very optimistic, optimistic that inshallah, it will be, inshallah, the paradise, the eternal happiness, the eternal happiness. Because uh, I love that Nusha statement says, you know, whatever you do you know, for sake of uh, the eternal, with capital E, it will become eternal. Whatever you do for sake of the eternal, al-baqi, it will become baqi. So therefore, uh, you know, to increase our positive thinking, uh, that there should be, you know, tafakkur in our life as well. Contemplation. You know, as Rasulullah Sallallahu he would look at the heavens, would say, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila. Or Allah, you did not create this in vain. So look at everything with the wisdom. You know, for example, sometimes I, when I go at, 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 you know, at my backyard, I have a cup of tea or coffee there, I look at the flies, I look at the bees, I look at, you know, uh, the ants, I look at the, the, you know, whatever plants and so. When I contemplate it, I can see the beauty, how, you know, 20 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reflected for in each creation. Al-Khaliq, Al-Jameel, Al-Razzaq, al hay Al-Muqaddir, and so on. So there's a strong correlation between husnuzan and tafakkur. Then how much we are doing tafakkur in such way? Because husnuzan will lead the positive tafakkur as well, by the way. And it will lead ma'rifatullah. And, and then you can see, 
you know, the, the benefit of Husnuzan psychologically. But in contrary, with the Suizan, it will lead to disaster. You know, uh, we can look at everything with Suizan. That's, we have this ability too. So uh, for Ismail Haqq Bursevi, he says, you know, to reach the degree of, you know, what we call the Husnuzan or because Marifatullah is the key, uh, he says, dhikr, remembrance, as you know, even the dhikr, the intention is the key. You know, when uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrived in Medina, do you know what, what was his first khutbah? Does anyone know? The first khutbah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina, the day he arrived, or the, the, the first Friday. Well, uh, very difficult question, of course. Uh, I did not know, by the way, I learned from one of my students, Alhamdulillah. Uh, according to Ibn Hajj al-Afqalani, the first khutbah was, al You know, intentions are according to, so these are according to intentions. You know, first khutbah, if you read it, it is three sentences. Look at the, today's Imam's khutbahs, you know, half an hour, one hour. Look at the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. khutbah, the longest one, six minutes, if you read it, the last, last sermon. So, you know, I thought about that, you know, just put yourself in the people of that time in Medina. Put, put yourself, you know, imaginary, maybe not good to say it, but put yourself in the shoes of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You suffered for 13 years. Your companion were killed. You were persecuted. And you are arriving in a peaceful place. And they are greeting you with joy. What will you talk about? But he made an important task that are affecting our Hussain as well. Intention. Therefore, Imam Bukhari, he used that hadith as a first hadith in his hadith book. So think positively. As I said, that when you eat food, think that is from the Jannah. You know, when you see a Tariq, the name is Tariq, you can say this. Or this could be Tariq bin Ziyad. When you see, you know, uh, Fatih, you can say this, this person can be like a Fatih Sultan Muhammad. You know, when, when we say Fatma, uh, th this, this Fatma can be like the daughter of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, having such a broader universal thinking. You know, when I call Adhan here uh, in Melbourne, because uh, as much as I can, I, I, I try to perform my Salat with Adhan. When I say, for example, you know, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, I say, oh my Allah, you know, take my voice to every corner of the world. I know that only we'd be heard between four walls. Or when I say, hey Allah Salah, come for prayer, I say, oh Allah, take this with, with that intention to every corner of the world, to every ears of a believer, or even non, non believer too. Come, come for prayer, come for salvation. So thinking positively, having universal intention, that also is an important in regarding to Husnuzan. So I have um, two, three minutes. I, you know, if I summarize it, rational aspects of that, scientific aspects of that, you know, look at uh, uh, Ibn Sina's theory, particularly about the Waham, because the contrary is Husnuzan. And he's a wonderful scholar about this issue, by the way. Still, many articles have been written, and still many are being written. And, and second, spiritually, having good intention and be, be, you know, be, be careful about what we perceive through five senses. If we hear a ghiba, you know, backbiting, say astaghfirullah. Something negative comes to our mind, say astaghfirullah, straight ahead. So there's a very strong correlation between husnuzan and our spiritual life. Because suizan, about Allah, even some says is major sin, some, according to some scholars. And suizan, or you know, ill thinking for other human fellows, particularly when we think about a people, a group. If I say all Arabs like this, stuff Allah, or all Turks like that, and this is also, you know, uh, a very risky and that ill thinking, uh, you know, it could lead, uh, you know, uh, a spiritual disaster. Uh, in our life as well. And in the practical way, I think uh, it's important to do tafakkur, to look at 
as, as I mentioned earlier, with Nabavi outlook, the prophetic outlook, look at everything with wisdom, think about the consequence, and think you know, about the beauty behind that. You know, when there's too much rain, some people, they say, terrible in the West. Astaghfirullah. You know, even it's flood. But there are some good, good consequences of the flood as well. So, uh, you know, therefore, uh, if I summarize, you know, there's a very uh, strong correlation between positive thinking in our spiritual life, between husn zan in our, uh, you know, practices in daily time, a very strong correlation between uh, well-being and husnuzan and there's very strong correlation even between brotherhood and sisterhood and very strong correlation I think for a peaceful society and so husnuzan uh, if I finish with the uh, you know Rasulullah Sallallahu words uh, it is uh, ibadah it's ibadah and it should be part of our life and to develop such uh, husnuzan we need to do a lot of exercise and a lot of work maybe read sometimes but the consequence, it will be you know, intellectual satisfaction that you will never forget that moment in your life as well as in the hereafter. So inshallah, I'll stop here. If you have any question, I'll be happy to respond to your question, inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Saleh. That was uh, very good. It just seems, sounds like Husnuvan is such an integral part of a Muslim's life and just branches out into so many areas like tafak, good positive action, intention, and so forth. So um, that was very uh, insightful. And I like that too, particularly with the names, where if you see someone with a particular name, think of a, someone pious who has that name. It, it really, you know, you're definitely thinking positively about that person. And inshallah, it becomes like a dua for that person yep. as well. Yep. Uh, absolutely. So at this point, yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, it, feel free to, uh, yeah, feel free to ask. I haven't unmuted you. I'm hoping that you, you're okay to type. It just makes it a bit easier. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask, um, type it away. Um, I guess maybe while people are thinking about questions, one question that comes to my mind is, in some circumstances, it's it's easy to have a positive opinion or positive thought, but sometimes when we see a lot of evil, although you did mention some examples, Dr. Sali, about, you know, the Karbala, for example, um, but when we see a lot of suffering, it may be difficult to have a positive opinion. Um, it may be, could, would you both want to touch on that? Yeah, ladies first. Nakis. I'm immersed in the conversation. Um, so from what I understand, uh, it's like in the face of some uh, evil. Uh, was that the question? Uh, sorry, Particularly that... serious evil, uh, you know, genocide, let's say, thinking genocide or, um, you know, young children being uh, treated really badly or something, you know, things that can happen really badly in this world. How do we deal with those? How do we reconcile that with, with Husnadan? Um I know like when we were like when I was thinking about this and when people say that you usually like you know sometimes it's they are evil like that that happens like evil that is afflicted by other human beings upon human beings that's different to uh, giving a surrendering to the wisdom of when things happen from a destiny point of view I guess what role do we play um I mean, it's a very tough question, personally. I'm sure uh, Dr. Saleh can uh, give a little bit, uh, a lot more insight. But from what I, I gauge that, um, theoretically speaking, I haven't experienced uh, certain things, but uh, like genocide and those tough things with uh, children. I mean, the human afflicted evil, um, I mean, in the, in the, in the spectrum of, uh, from God's point of view, that A, this world is funny, it's ephemeral, it's transient. Uh, B, um, that Allah is a witness and a just God. Uh, C, that if there is an agency that we're not meant to be just uh, surrendering it with, without action. I think this whole husnazan and active tawakkul is also very related. Like uh, Dr. Salia was saying that we need to do whatever we can in our power to be able to prevent this, that situation or get remove ourselves from it. But if push comes to shove and we were to be immersed in such a situation, I, I, guess, I, I guess the surrendering in the wisdom of God that in the sight of suffering when there is no outing out of it, 
Um, that kind of an endurance perhaps is that immediate poison, but the consequences of it, again, like Dr. Saleh was saying, the consequences of those things might have far superior spiritual um, uh, benefits if we were to bring the time factor into it, if we were to look at beyond this world and its transience to the to the hereafter, the consequences of these uh, experiences that if we couldn't be prevented from experiencing must have had uh, somewhat something in us. I know I don't want to talk too much, but I remember one of the Nazis from Nazi Germany, uh, one of the survivors was saying that that hope, well, while they were in the midst of these very intense concentration camp, he always uh, cultivated the sense of hope that there was a very solution mind. He was very solution uh, oriented that somehow I'm going to escape it. And somehow, of course, with divine uh, will, he managed to escape it. And he was speaking with hindsight that he actually run away from that because of those virtues of this hopefulness being solution minded and not seeing the end of it as an end. It's all a means. I guess these are the things that comes to my mind. Mm. Okay. Dr. Sully? Well, uh... Uh, I was on uh, sabbatical leave in UK and, and at one of the university, uh, I one of the lecturers told me that when they invented uh, the camera, uh, I think it was uh, during the Second World War, that rec in that records in the dark. And so the professor did, and then he asked his students, you know, whatever they want, they can do it. He turned off the lights and he recorded what they did. And then he said, okay, then turn on the lights, and he showed you know, what he recorded. Then he said, he made, a, he made a statement. He said, actually, there is no dark. It is dark for us. In reality, there's no darkness. So uh, yes, you know, whether such difficult things, including genocide, uh, it is uh, evil, you know, without that, you know, that's to us. But on the, on the, on the other hand, you know, during the, that recent earthquake in Turkey, uh, you know, my sister passed away as, as well. When I, uh, you know, was uh, walking, I saw two, two pigeons on my way. Uh, they, they, they were having ha having rest. I did not want to even bother them. What I realized that time, when I, you know, changed my way not to bother to, to pigeons, I realized that, you know, such disaster, such, you know, oppression, actually on one hand is contributing positively to other people's emotions. Let's say if there's no disaster on earth, you know, no death, just imagine. Our mercy emotion, compassionate emotion, or other emotion, maybe they will die gradually. So there, there, there should be a time that the emotion should be, you know, kind of like a, a work or should be something that triggered them. I think such uh, the bad things that we dislike in most of the time, it triggers people's emotions positively. One of the TV re channel reporter was interviewing me. She started weeping. I was so surprised when, I went, when she, she was interviewing me, you know, she, I then realized that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually created such emotions in every human being. We don't know how many emotions we do have. Maybe you have thousands. I don't know how many of the psychologists they identified yet. So I think such things uh, causes some good things as well. Okay. All right. So we've got two minutes. Thank you. There were very good responses. So I'm going to read the three questions I see. So um, I'll read them three. And then if you can respond to <clears throat> combine the answers in one minute each, please. When we get thoughts or negative intentions, how do you just stop? What method mechanisms can we use? It's hard to just stop thinking, at least for a long time. Uh, and the next one's similar. Any exercises you can recommend to help train your mind for positive thinking or husmadan? Um, and the third one is, how do you continuously stay positive when you suffer physical pain through illness and or disability? Yeah, my kiss, you wanna go first, please? Uh, okay, inshallah. The, uh, the, the illness and the uh, exercise, what are the exercises? I think from uh, uh, Dr. Savi, as you were talking, I was taking notes from what you said. I, I really like the 
correlation between uh, uh, consequences of like, you know, having uh, positive thinking, but also thinking of the consequences. And in respect to events like illnesses and so forth that comes to our lives, uh, and in which, I mean, of course, if there's any course of action to be done, we have to take that. We're not meant to be passive in that respect. But if we were to, you know, be afflicted with some chronic illness, at, at the end of the day, uh, again, looking at the larger wisdom behind that, it comes from the Lord himself. Um, and the best of the best, uh, the prophets went through such, uh, such a things. And in that in that suffering, not that we welcome it, but if that was God's wisdom upon us and we were to be afflicted by it, in and of itself and that pain and agony is the very growth that perhaps is our unique training system by the divine. So maybe we have something within us that needs to come to fruition, that latent capability, uh, in that insanic or Adamic uh, capability to come to fruition and then earn the best of the best outcomes, which is the pleasure of God as we come out. So no pain, no gain. I don't want to belittle that, but uh, even if I were to be, and we don't want to speak big, I don't want to speak big, but if God's uh, justice, uh, sorry, not justice, if his wisdom is about afflicting us with a suffering and a physical trial, uh, then we know the likes of Ayub alayhi salam uh, and uh, and the the, the dem demonstrations before us that in that there is wisdom. And may Allah allow us to endure it with patience for there's nothing that hasn't got, uh, uh, like the Prophet has got a solution. There's nothing that doesn't have a solution. Um, and uh, everything in this world is not inconsequential. There's, it's just that uh, it's a, snip, a snippet. The consequences are be to harvest it in the hereafter. And Ya Baqi Antal Baqi, again, what Dr. Saleh said, uh, we, we count on his uh, eternalizing uh, our response to that. I guess the gist of my thing with the istighfar and all of that uh, is our response to situations. If it is comes connecting things to him and submitting to his wisdom, then uh, inshallah, with a bias towards hope, we 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 surrender to that. Sorry, that was my two cents. Well, well thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, I think for practical side of to have a you know positive thinking instead of negative thinking, when uh, ill thinking comes to our mind. You know, we, if you can eat something, drink something, uh, listen some Quran or good music that you like it, uh, halal music, I mean, uh, and even a walk uh, or tafakkur, it will be helpful. Uh, you know, talk to someone, it will be helpful. Uh, for, for regard to the illnesses, uh, you know, the life is in motion. If we don't have such things, uh, the life will become miserable for us. We'll become like a robot. We will not enjoy our life. So everything is known by opposite. If there are 5% of the people, let's say in the world, they are sick or disabled, uh, then 95% of the people, they look at them, we hope, look at them and they get the wisdom. They learn lesson from them. And they also uh, value uh, their health, their lifestyle. You know, so everything is known by opposite. That's the one side. The other side is, Mac is mentioned uh, spiritual aspects of that, so I wouldn't go in detail of that. But to uh, to have a resilience, so you know, to at least uh, bear it, I think uh, as much as we can, you know, keeping our five senses busy uh, with the good things. Mm, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing your wisdom tonight. And inshallah, may Allah enable us to have the husnadan uh, to bring peace to our uh, to our lives and to ensure we have a better life in this world and the next. So thanks everyone. Um, we look forward to seeing you all in future uh, events as well. I've actually just put a link. This is an event that we've got coming up on Saturday. Uh, it's another online event, um, great speakers, two international speakers. So I would highly recommend that uh, event as well. Uh, and it's good to see, uh, it's probably one of the events where we've, online events where we've had the same number of people stay to the end. I think that's a good sign. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, that's a, I, I'm assuming you've all benefited from it. We look forward to seeing you in other future events. And once again, thank you, Dr. Sali and Mickey's uh, for your time and commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.